The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Some time ago I gave, I had two messages back when we had Studio Tuesday, and we don't have Studio Tuesday yet. Uh, Do you feel like the whole world's on hold? (laughs) But in the meantime, we should be pressing into God all the more. And some time ago, I was thinking, oh gee, everybody's been quarantined and they're all, they need comforted. And God says, no, I want you to afflict the comfortable. (laughs) And then comfort the afflicted. But the afflicting the comfortable came first. (laughs) So I think today might be to comfort the afflicted. How's that? So I'm fair, right? God is fair. Actually, favor is not fair, but favor is good. Anyway, actually, that's the title of the message. The Comforter. And what was interesting is I was preparing this and I had the thought, uh, Catherine Coleman used to make a statement, uh, the Holy Spirit is more real to me than the world around me, okay? And all of a sudden, uh, the presence of God had me weeping and I was thinking, and I'm not a crier, uh, and I'm weeping over the fact about the key word comfort and friendship. And I've been in ministry 45 years or so. I don't even know. It's been so long, I don't even know if that's the right number. Uh, But but, uh, I was thinking about friends. I have pastor friends, a lot of them with the Lord. I was always the baby pastor in the little group that I was in. I've had friends that have gone to be with the Lord. I've had friends that come and go. I can remember as a young pastor the, the agony, and I don't think you ever get apart from it, because even Jesus himself said what? This is my mother and my brother and my sister, they who do the will of God from the heart. There is a Holy Spirit connection of family that transcends natural family. And even in the early church, the Jewish apostles when teaching the Gentiles, said, look, your father can bring you into this world, but it's going to be the spiritual father that teaches you how to live in this world. And that, so it it is quite an honor, isn't it? And I know that there's a lot of people that have seen me as a spiritual father and Jennifer as a spiritual mother over the years. Um, But I also remember the agony of people that come and go uh, relationally. You may have had friends that come and go. Maybe they were close at one time, then suddenly they disappeared. There's a, there's a, a perception of something being removed. And uh, as a pastor, I don't know that that ever goes away because you'll have people, oh, I'm behind you, pastor. I'll be, I'm so far behind you now. <laughs> you can't even see me. Uh, and, and there's users and there's contributors. Users are trying to see what they can get from the from the relationship, but they give nothing. And I used to get a kick out of those. They even just say, I don't believe in tithing. Oh, but you tithe. You, you give the first 10% goes to your God. So find out where your God is. Um, and then there's, there's uh, friends that are with you and then they get offended by some little thing. Have you ever had that happen? And you don't even know what it was not even the courtesy of finding out what it was, and you feel like something was ripped out of your heart. I can remember as a young pastor, uh, and my heart still breaks for that, is I saw little kids learning that their Sunday school teacher was aunt so-and-so and and aunt this. You ever, anybody relate to this? And then the next thing you know, uh, they were disgruntled about something that went on in the church. They didn't like the color of the curtains or something. Really, a lot of times it's, it's, it's childish. And they're gone, and the little kid's going, what happened to Aunt Susie? What happened to Aunt? You know, it just kind of breaks your heart. That relationship is looked at with such, 
it's like, it's fragile. But yet God has given a solution. I look at that early church, those Gentiles coming out of an, a totally ungodly world with no foundation whatsoever. They had, they, if you had a baby girl and you didn't want a girl, you just left her out in the cold to die. I mean, that was their culture. And you know what's funny about culture is if everybody does it, you think it's okay. They had to learn right from wrong all over again, just like they were in kindergarten. And quite frankly, I still think even the church now is so affected by culture. Um, more people are shaped by the apostles and prophets on CNN and NBC and all those than they are by the church. It's pretty pathetic, really. Um, and it's so easy to be brainwashed in these days. But I'm walking and all of a sudden I'm realizing that when I look back, and I'll tell you, like I said, I'm not a crier, but all of a sudden the presence of God came on me and I just wept. I said, but you know, through it all, because not all those experiences are bad. Mm -hmm. And some of them you even learn from what is a relationship and what is not a relationship. What's required and what's unnecessary. What, is, what benefits the relationship and what, what actually works against the relationship. And when I was thinking of all those things, all of a sudden the Spirit of God just, kind of, uh, just, I just started weeping. And I'm saying, you know what? He's the best friend that I ever had or ever will have. I knew when I married Jennifer, I said, unless she's my best friend, I'm not getting married. My criteria over the years was that friendship was the root issue. If you're not friends, you're not going to make a marriage. You're not going to make a friendship mean anything other than two people using one another to see how they can further themselves. You know, they have terms for all of that, codependency, counterdependency. But, but the point is, the Holy Spirit is the comforter. And I'm thinking, we have right now a revelation of the Holy Spirit as a person. And let, let, let me read to you the definition of this comforter, this Holy Spirit that's a person that dwells us and will be the best friend you've ever had if you allow the relationship to develop. But in John 16, 7, in the Amplified Translation, it says, I'm telling you nothing but the truth. When I say it is profitable, this is Jesus speaking, it is profitable, it is good, it is expedient, it is advantageous for you that I go away, because if I do not go away, the Comforter will not come. The Comforter... In the Amplified, it says the counselor, the helper, the advocate, the intercessor, the strengthener, and the standby will not come. Will not come to you in close fellowship with you. But if I go away, I will send him to you to be in close fellowship with you. I look back over my life and I'm thinking, how glorious. That you could never be alone even when you felt like you were alienated, rejected, left by yourself. God never leaves you. He never leaves you nor forsakes you. And He's there. He's your paraclete. He's your standby, your advocate. Think about friendships that you've had over the years. There's none that promises that this is in my character and in my nature. My character and my nature is that I am a comforter. And quite frankly, everything other than the Holy Spirit for a believer is a false comfort. I don't care if it's comfort food, hobbies, something that you do to make yourself feel good. It's still a false comfort compared to the true comforter whose only one whose name deserves comforter is the Holy Spirit. He's your counselor. You know, if you would go to the Spirit instead of your friends... I watch people go for counsel and they go to 10 different people hoping they find one that agrees with them. That's not counseling. And, and the other thing is you go to a lot of people to complain, you're basically gathering troops. That's a Jezebel spirit. Hmm? Doesn't Jezebel operate that way? Gather troops. See if I can't get enough people. And then, and then 
I think of all of this blessed value we have in the comforter of the Holy Spirit, we have the legitimate, why would we want to settle for a counterfeit? And even in the early years of ministry, I would watch people who were, uh, uh, I would say they were rejected and they never dealt with their rejection. They will pick up on someone in the church who's had rejection. And then they go over and they, oh, no, 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 no. That's not ministry. That's identification. Two hurt people don't minister life. We've got to get to the place where the Holy Spirit can deal with rejection to the point that you are a victor no matter what you've been through. Amen. You have a friend that sticks closer than a brother, and there's absolutely zero excuse. Bill Morford was in our church when we uh, had a church plant in Columbia, and it was fun. Uh, a lot of times I'd say something in the Hebrew, and he'd go like this. <laughs> and, uh, but he, he discovered something that wasn't that interesting to him, but it blew me out of the water. How many know that when, when in the scripture it goes, I am, I am, that the reason it's repeated is for emphasis? I don't care if it's truly, truly. I am, I am. Truly, truly, I say. Okay? That's, that's a Hebrew uh, concept of emphasis. But there's like 30-some double I am's throughout the scriptures. All right? 30-some. I am, I am. So that means... Whatever I am, I am says, he's emphasizing it. But he said there was three double I am's that were different than all the other three double I am's. And it was like an emphasis of an emphasis. If there's such, how do you explain that? I don't know. He didn't know even. He says, it's like, I, it's like I am, I am, and nobody else can do this but me. Which, if God says it, I believe him. <laughs> nobody else could do it but him. I am, I am your deliverer, your savior, and no one can save you besides me. So much for the many roads to God, huh? I am, I am your savior, and none can save. I am, I am, that's the first one. And it was, uh, uh, I don't know if I get the Hebrew right, but one was, this typical one was ani, ani. Ani, ani, I am, I am. This one is anohi, anohi. So I guess even in the sound of it, it sounds a little more authoritative. Like, that's kind of an uh, understatement. How could God be, you know, overstate himself or understate himself? I don't know. But I just found it fascinating. I am, I am your Savior, and there's none that can do it. Now, that's a characteristic that for some reason was amplified in the Scriptures for our benefit. I am, I am your Lord and Savior, and nobody can save you except me. Secondly, I am, I am your forgiver. And no one else can wash away your sin. No one. I am, I am the one that forgives your sin. And the last one is I am, I am, Isaiah 51, 12, I believe. I am, I am your comforter. And no one else can comfort. All else is a false comfort. And trust me, people look for substitutes all the time to feel good. They will find something, even the wrong thing, to comfort them. And I do not believe the average Christian, any Christian, has a vacuum. You have Jesus in you, the power of the Holy Spirit. But if you have a need, a legitimate need, because God did make you a legitimate need. He made you with needs for love, for affection, for peace, for security, for approval. He made you with those needs. But you have met those needs either in the flesh or by God. They're, all needs are either met righteously or unrighteously. And, and uh, Jeremiah 2, it calls it a cistern. Substitute. My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain, the counselor, the standby, the comforter, their advocate. They've forsaken me, and they've hewn for themselves cisterns, substitutes, substitutes to meet those needs. But God says, I'm the one that's inner. I'm the intercessor in you. I'm the one who's standing by you. I'm the one that strengthens you. 
if that's not your, I'm the one that stands by when other people leave. You better draw close to that person because you'll never find a human being like the Holy Spirit and his attributes. And everything you need, you need him. He's the comforter. He's your counselor. He's your helper. He's your advocate, your intercessor, your strengthener, and your standby. What beautiful quality, and it's the best friend I ever had. And I started weeping when I realized uh, I've seen, I've had friends come and go. Some are with the Lord. Some, some just, you know, get hurt for one reason. Some, are, some actually, quite frankly, in the early years, I, I was part of a Catholic charismatic movement, and a lot of people got saved, but I wanted more, and I saw a lot of my friends didn't. And so there's kind of like a separation. It wasn't like you're mad at one another, but saying, I'm going somewhere, and apparently you don't want to continue on that journey. And so there's greater and lesser connections. But in these greater or lesser connections, the greater and the lesser connections need to be based on the Holy Spirit connection and kinship. Jesus said it himself. He said, you know, I might, I'm not here to bring peace but a sword. There's people in your family that are not going to want Jesus, and there's people that are, and that's going to cause a division. Nevertheless, choose life or death. I want us to have a revelation of the Comforter, especially in these times, because I see some aspects of why God is revealing this message on the friendship of the Comforter, uh, and everything is because Quite frankly, I believe you have a mandate to comfort, but you can't give something you don't have. You can spend your whole life trying to get it from other people, and you're just a user. You know, that's unfortunate, but from as long as I can remember, I sat in pastor's groups on a weekly basis, and they all said there's, there's contributors and there's consumers. There's people that want to get and try to get everything for nothing, and then there's people that will literally lay down their lives for their relationship, for their friends. Um, that's just the way the world spins. But I'll tell you, the most foolish thing anybody could do is to reject, grieve, resist the comforter of the Holy Spirit, who is the best friend you'll ever have. People will come and go. But I'll tell you what, he'll never leave you or forsake you. It's up to you to, to cultivate that relationship, though. It's not going to just fall out of the sky. It's going to require effort on your part. You're going to have to learn to, uh, uh, first of all, uh, let's start out with a little bit of a training session on really cultivating that relationship with the Holy Spirit. Everything that I have to show for today did not come through much study, but came through the education of the heart by the anointing of God. I once discipled a brilliant Harvard engineer. He was doing 10 engineers' jobs. And... Yeah. But the point that he couldn't escape was that the education of the mind it comes through much study, but the education of the heart comes only by the anointing of God. And so I'd say step one, if you're going to really have a friendship with God, if you're really going to know the Holy Spirit, not know about the Holy Spirit, but really know Him, the first thing is, is Romans 8, 16, it says, the Spirit himself bears witness with you in your spirit that you are a child of God. That's your own no-so. How we used to be grieved when we used to travel church to church and we'd see people that we had to pray for them. We would, they would go to the altar to get saved periodically, again and again and again. You know, that, that just grieves me because that's saying they lack the assurance of the heart that they are born again. They, their spirit isn't bearing witness that they're a child of God, and so they're into religion, and so they try harder all the time. They repented a lot, but didn't see the supernatural transaction take place. 
Jennifer, come up here a minute. I want, I want to show you what we had to do. This is kindergarten, but it's necessary. That's the, that's the sad thing of the state of the church. You're going to build a relationship. Here's what we used to have to do with these people. They would come to the altar continually to get saved. <laughs> we would have to have them put their hand right here. Here's, here's the door of the heart. There's your knower. You have a knower and a knower. That's why we say, I know, then I know. And I'd have them close their eyes and pay attention to your human spirit. And I'd say, behold, I, I, I literally would say in their ear, Romans 8, 16, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon me that I should be called a child of God. Actually, that's First John. But it's, it's, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon me that I should be called a child of God. And if their spirit would, Romans 8, 16, bear witness to their spirit, I'd say, did that feel good or bad? Come on, this is not rocket science. And they'd say, well, not, not very comfortable. Well, then let's ask Jesus to come into your heart then. You're not saved. By saved means I didn't read my Bible and I know what, what, what to do. It was, did, was there a supernatural transaction? Was there a new birth? And did that new birth actually result in a supernatural transaction or a supernatural exchange? Did I have a no-so in my heart? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence, the title deed, the assurance that something actually happened. So yeah, quite frankly, I know they don't like that faith is a feeling, but faith is a spiritual feeling. It's an assurance where your spirit bears witness with his spirit. See, the trouble is there's carnal feelings there's emotional feelings, and then there's spiritual feelings. And we can't get you to the spiritual feelings if the other ones are all messed up and cloudy. Thank you. You're saved now. <laughs> Jennifer's spirit felt good, so I know that she has the assurance. Is the Holy Spirit your friend? Is that who you go to first, or do you go get a second opinion? Or do you... Oh, my favorite one in the church after 45 years are the people that ask your opinion after the fact. <laughs> you know what that means? You didn't really want someone else's opinion. After you do it, then you go ask an opinion. You, you want what you want, and you did it what you wanted to do. And that opinion afterwards, Lord knows what the motive was for that. Probably to make yourself feel better or whatever. We also had a uh, set of precedent in my first pastorate, even as a young pastor, is that if you get advice, you get it from one person. Once you go to multiple people, you're doing damage. Because all you need is one person to slightly tweak it the other way and you're confused. Or you're looking to hear what you want to hear. You don't want truth. You're not a lover of the truth. You're a lover of what you want to have said. But you know what? The Holy Spirit will tell you, this is truth, this is error. That's where your confidence should be. Go to God first. Let God search your heart. People rely even on counselors. I don't rely on counselors. To me, a counselor is a mere instrument to ask you a few questions. But in reality, ultimately, you need to live with what the Holy Spirit says. Right? There's authority of God's nature. Then there's His Word. His Word and His nature need to match. Then there's the conscience. And that's your responsibility. Then there's spiritual authority. Do you realize spiritual authority is kind of on the bottom? It's God first, His Word first. Conscience is your responsibility, then spiritual authority. Ultimately, you are responsible for your life. <laughs> And yet you have indwelt as a believer the counselor. <laughs> I probably upset some people with the counselor thing, but you know what? I'm old enough now. Deal with it. All right? Because there's a place for counselors. There's a place for doctors. There's a place for everybody. But the point is your priority needs to be the Holy Spirit. That's the real thing. And I've seen 
counselors who went into that profession because they had a need to be needed that was never met righteously. Uh-oh. We're going to get emails on this one, honey. You can answer the emails, all right? Isn't that true, though? Does that make sense? Actually, to be, to be real honest, there's school teachers that have become school teachers because they were abused as a child in school. You don't deal with your root issues, and you become a teacher to get even. Oh, my goodness, what's this preacher saying? What I'm saying is you've got to learn that matters of the heart will always be the heart of the matter. And the real you has a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And that Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. That's his job. Quit looking to the world or to culture or even to people for the answers when he himself is the answer and he's available to you. The fact that you do not seek him out is a major, major mistake. Wouldn't you think? I mean, here's someone that God said, it's better that I go because I'm going to send you the comforter, the counselor, the helper, the advocate, the intercessor, the strengthener, and the standby. Which of those do you not want? <laughs> really? Oh, I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't, I don't need anybody. Well, I can tell you what your need is. I don't need anybody. One of the definitions of a narcissist is they are so insecure that they have to exalt themselves on a regular basis. Now, that insecurity could be remedied by what? An inner assurance. Is security a legitimate need? Yeah. We were made that way. How you get it resolved is, makes all the decisions. It's either going to be a cistern or a substitute, or it's going to be God himself meeting your needs according to his riches and glory. So, but the Spirit bears witness. The second aspect of that Holy Spirit is he's teaching. Luke 12, 12 says, For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. There's times where we've ministered to people, and I, had, I didn't have a clue as to what to tell them. But you know, right at the moment when they open their mouth, the Holy Spirit gives you what to say. We once ministered to a lady in Charleston that uh, the pastor didn't know what to do, so they put it on Jennifer and I. And the person says, the CIA is coming in at night, and they're injecting me. Now, what would you say to them? I didn't know what to say, but you know, right at that moment, the Holy Spirit just dropped it into my spirit just to say, you know, I can, for one thing, I can discern the fear when she's talking about it. It was a real fear for her, even if it's an imaginary situation. And the Holy Spirit revealed to me, you know, most people's fears are imaginary situations that they think could happen. So you know what I had to do? I had her drop down to her spirit. She was a believer. And she released forgiveness to those CIA people that are coming in and injecting her. And she got her peace back. And they say she didn't get totally better, but she was making progress from that point on. Most of you need to deal with imaginary fear. You know, you can fear something, make it up in your head, and you're basically even getting to the point where it can be a self-fulfilled prophecy, you can actually bring it to pass. Is that what you want? Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, think on these things. <laughs> I will keep them in perfect peace, shalom, shalom, whose creative imagination is stayed on me, whose mind, and that actual translation is creative imagination is stayed on me. Stay out of the fantasy and start believing what God says. He's your teacher. He'll teach you what to say. John 14, 26, the helper, the comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, and he will bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. 
Have you ever talked with somebody and suddenly you surprised yourself remembering stuff that you had learned a long time ago? Suddenly you're starting to say the right answers. Did you ever say something by the power of the Holy Spirit and you impressed yourself? <laughs> you know, why did you impress yourself? Because it wasn't really you. And you go, whoa, that was really, unless you go, you know, boy, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good there. That would be a mistake, right? But come on, it's humbling to know that he's there and he loves you and he loves through you. And when your heart is open towards someone else, he can actually function through you with great wisdom. First John 2.27 The anointing which you have received, remember, if you're born again, there was a supernatural transaction. You are a new creation. They that are joined to the Lord are one spirit with Him. That's the real you, by the way. And that's the other thing that was so disheartening when we traveled. We watched Christians get all flustered and frustrated and confused over the word you. I went and watched two pastors argue one time. You can't heal anybody. And the other one said, yes, you can. It was the difference in the word you. You can do all things through Christ. That you is joined together with Him, co-opting the new creation you can. Apart from Him, you can't do anything. So when someone says you, I want to know who they're talking about. Because one you needs straightened away. The other you needs to be relinquished to the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the real you. We have to teach people to forgive. Matter of fact, to this day, people go, oh, yeah, I know that Dennis and Jennifer, those are forgiveness people. I'm thinking, I'd like to think we have a little bit more to teach than forgiveness, but you know the problem is, is in all honesty, most of the church didn't know how to forgive from the heart. They forgave from the head and even developed the theology. It must be difficult because I've been trying for years to forgive that man of mine. I've been trying to forgive that wife of mine. I've been trying to forgive those kids of mine. Well, guess what? You're not doing it right because forgiveness is like salvation. It's instant when it's done from the heart. But if you do it from the head, you're gonna, it's going to be like water on a, rolling on a rock. Eventually, you might do it right by accident <laughs> and go, wow, that was hard. And then you develop a theology that it must be hard, take a long time. Well, you know, God will take you by the easiest way you're willing to go if that's the way you've learned stuff the hard way, then you'll probably continue to stay in that hard way. But it doesn't have to be. The Holy Spirit's there to guide you into all truth. He wants to teach you. You have an anointing. It abides within. You really don't need anybody to, to teach you. That doesn't mean we don't need teachers, right? You don't need anybody to teach you. You need to be taught by the Holy Spirit. And you need to know when the Holy Spirit's teaching you how to respond properly. And if you learn and allow the Holy Spirit to teach you how to respond properly, you will learn how to, how to receive from the Holy Spirit through another vessel. Not just information, but anointing. Because you have an anointing. And where is it? Where is this anointing? It abides in you. Well, if it's in you and you don't, you're not using it, whose fault is that? You should be pursuing that anointing. You have an anointing. And it abides. And he will, you are so uniquely, I like uh, Jason's message, you are uniquely loved. And sometimes you have to correct that where God loves everybody the same. <laughs> he loves everybody. But He loves you uniquely. You're a one of a kind. There never was another you. There never will be another you. You don't want to be a copy of somebody else. So when God has an anointing in you to teach you, He will take you by the easiest way you're willing to go. And right now I just saw a flash. I just saw a bit in the bridle. And he's saying, thus saith the Lord. This is probably someone watching by video, not in the room, right? I want to guide you with my eye, not with a bit in the bridle. So if he'll take you by the easiest way you're willing to go, how many want to make a commitment? God, I want to go the easier way. I will submit to you. I will yield to you. I want to go by the easier way. My mother got that through. After many beatings, Dennis the Menace growing up, 
After many beatings, I finally realized that she could guide me with her eye. All she'd have to do is go. I go, all right, all right, all right. Wisdom is to learn from previous situations. Not, that didn't hurt. You ever had a kid that said that? That didn't hurt when you spank a kid. That didn't hurt. Of course, now they don't believe in spanking at all. <laughs> that ought to be interesting to see that generation. Actually, I think we're seeing some of that generation. Wow. <laughs> they need spiritual parenting. Mm -hmm. And actually, the church should be reparenting. But if it's going to reparent, it has to be the Holy Spirit and not man's flesh. Apart from him, you can do nothing. You have an anointing. He wants to teach you concerning all things, and it is true and not a lie. And just as he has taught you, you will be able to abide in him. Spirit anointing. Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to set the captives free, to heal the brokenhearted. When he discipled me, he kept using Isaiah 54. I'm going to awaken you morning by morning. I'm going to give you the tongue of a disciple that you might know how to speak to him who is weary. And if a person is weary, you, need, you have a responsibility. You can't give something you don't have. So you can give somebody a lot of advice. If there's no anointing on it, what good is it, really? What good, good is advice? Sometimes it's yes and sometimes it's no. But what God's basically saying is that, one, God himself is the comforter. He's the source. I am, I am the one that comforts you. Everything else is a false comfort. Now, we all know we need love, hope, peace. We all need to feel like we belong. We all need approval, acceptance, security. Now, what if the Holy Spirit was not the source of getting those needs met? Do you agree we need acceptance, approval, security, identity, significance, affirmation? Are those things we need? He made us to need those things. Here's the way some people get those needs met. Willpower by trying harder, unhealthy relationships, social status, possessions, hobbies, food, shopping, drugs and alcohol, sex, money, job and career, title or position, family and children, sports, fantasy, vacations, travel, and entertainment. Now, those are not sinful in and of themselves, but they are if it's a substitute for the Holy Spirit and the work of God to meet a legitimate need. My God shall supply all of your need, but you do not have voids. You have legitimate needs, and they're either being met by God, and my suggestion is meet them by God. Because every time... Through the years, as a young pastor, and spending time with church, and watching people come and go, and watching people fight and argue, watching people badmouth one another, watching people misinterpret what was going on, and all the hurts and unnecessary woundings, most of the time, they were not getting their need met by the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. They were getting their need met by some cistern. Like, I used to have people that... Um, if you were honest, they, I always use the example of my first church so we don't get nobody in trouble in this place. But my first church, it was, Pastor, Pastor, I love you, Pastor, I love you. She'd tell me she loved me so regularly, but every time she said it, in here it would go. <laughs> and so I always gave her the benefit of doubt by God. She's trying. She must be trying. She says this so regularly. But in reality, she never got healed of authority figures in general. She needed ministry on her father. She needed ministry on bosses. She needed ministry on, she never got healed of that stuff. So there's root issues that if they're never dealt with, then everyone else is going to be the recipient of it. It's like they are walking around with barbed wire, looking who they, hi, hug me. 
poke you with all the points. And God has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness and, it, and the true comforter. But God's looking for the problem is there's barriers in our heart to allowing the flow of the comforter to minister to us, the comfort. And right now, the way culture is right now and the way stuff is out in society, I'm believing that God's given a mandate. It's not going to be the whole church. I don't care how many people, I don't care if they prophesy, cast out devils. Many of them are going to say, God's going to say, depart from me. I didn't know you intimately. You did not hunger and thirst after a relationship with the one that sticks closer than a brother. You hungered and thirsted for stuff, for renown, for a title, for a position, to be seen and heard, to get your needs met, to fix somebody else. Oh, this is the last place in the church. Don't ever tell me about someone you want to fix because you're, you're, you'll get it right between the eyes. That is such poor Christian living. You do not fix someone else. You deal with you. This is the wrong church if you think you're going to fix somebody else. Don't come here because we're only going to teach you one thing. We have found the enemy. It is you. <laughs> and you don't want to resist, quench, or grieve the Holy Spirit of God. You know, people that want to fix other people have the sin of pride and the inability to see that who's at the scene of every crime. I've been to 10 churches and they all didn't welcome me like they should. Who was at the scene of every crime? Hmm? Is this, is this life in the rope? And you experience this stuff at work too, saved and unsaved. You have a responsibility to minister the Holy Spirit no matter where you're at. Peace precedes your perception to all of life around you, and the Holy Spirit is more than willing to give that to you. So here's, here's the key, understanding the comforter. First of all, God says, I am, I am the comforter, and nobody can comfort besides me. There's just three points here. It's a three-point sermon. Now you get the notes. All the other stuff was examples. <laughs> he is the source of comfort. So all of your cutesy-poo hugs, a lot of times it's patronizing. You want to give something of value? Give something of value. And who is the most valuable comforter there is? God. I am, I am the comforter. Everything else is a false comfort. Secondly, if God is the giver of that comfort, I said, if I'm a child of God, and he said, I am your Savior, I am your forgiver, I am, I am your comforter. Second Corinthians says, comfort them with the same comfort whereby you were comforted. So in reality, if you don't know how to receive comfort from the Holy Spirit, you don't know how to give comfort to anybody. And yet I believe that's the mandate of the church. You should be able to minister comfort to the afflicted. But that's not a pat on the back, and that's not just commiserating that your pain is the same as their pain. That's not ministry. You're not giving them Holy Spirit when you're saying, my pain is like your pain. So what? Where's the redemption? The redemption is comfort them with the same comfort whereby you've been comforted in your time of affliction. If, if in your time of trials and afflictions, if you haven't handled it right and received the comfort of the Holy Spirit, you don't really have any comfort to give somebody else. And yet God's really got a mandate that you're to, 
What did, he, what did Jesus say about himself even? It's more blessed to give than to receive. I'm telling you, there's a hurting world out there, and when I say a hurting world, I'm talking about the church. I'm talking about the Christians. You be the solution. I always like that. Shall man press down, press down, shaking together, running all over? Shall man put in your bosom? You be the man. <laughs> you, you be the person that does it instead of the person who's looking to receive it. And how do I, how do I give something if I never received it? Well, first of all, you'd have to be open to receiving it. How many want to be open to receiving the comfort from the Holy Spirit? So I don't care what you're going through right now. I want the real thing. I don't want, I don't want people patronizing me. I don't want people saying nice words, but it doesn't have any unction in it. I want the comfort of the Holy Spirit. I want the real thing. You should want the real thing. If you've gone through something difficult and you feel the emotional pain, everybody in this church should know how to deal with emotional pain. You either receive God's self or others. There's got to be a forgiveness. And with forgiveness that comes from the heart, it always, say that with me again, just so I know you're listening. People, I want to hear you on the camera too, say the same thing. Always, always. takes the pain. I am so weary after 40 some years of ministry of going church to church and finding people go, well, I forgive. I just learned to live with the pain. <laughs> you didn't forgive. You gave mental assent. But Jesus takes the pain and the sorrow. That's the beauty of the conversion experience. Why stop with conversion? When you forgive, he takes the pain and the sorrow. And what does he put in its place? He puts the comfort of the Holy Spirit. He puts the peace of God. He comforts you during your affliction when you respond properly. Then, and only then, are you a candidate to give comfort. Comfort them with the same comfort whereby you were comforted in your time of affliction. So in your time of affliction, what should I do? Complain, criticize, control, compete, compare, conceal. Those are the deadly seas. They did it in the wilderness and they died. <laughs> they complained, they compared, they com criticized, they competed, they concealed, they controlled. Those are deadly seas. That's a, another sermon, all right? I won't give you that today. You've had that, the, the seven deadly seas. It killed them in the wilderness. God is not pleased with your competing, comparing, complaining, criticizing. And by the way, don't ever go to a house group and complain about somebody else. We will ask you to leave. Our house groups are accountability groups. I don't care what kind of house group you've been to in the past. Ours are not like that. You don't badmouth your husband. You don't badmouth your wife. You don't talk about your kids. We talk about what are your needs. What are the areas in your life that needs changed? I'm warning you, don't come to this church if you want to be a gossip, if you want to talk about other people. You know, John Wesley, that was the only reason he kicked him out of church? <laughs> gossip. Because we don't think that's a sin. We think we're stating our case. No, you're so, you have no concept of how far removed you are from God. And you know what? You'll be without comfort in it. There will be an adrenaline rush that is a counterfeit or a false peace. When I was a kid growing up on the street, it actually felt good if I punched somebody. That irritated me. But that's momentary. And then after that, you get guilty, ashamed, and you fortify that anger so that your temper's even shorter now. Oh, wow, that really accomplished a great deal. There was even a day when counselors used to say, punch a pillow to get rid of your tension. That fortifies it. You're building a muscle, an anger muscle. The more you punch that pillow, the angrier the person you're going to be. <laughs> I don't think we comforted the comfortable. I think we afflicted them today, didn't we? <laughs> but our mandate as a church is you can't give something you don't have. And what do people do, in, especially in, in, in 
the kind of churches that we're affiliated with, what do they do? They'll tell you about their gifting. You can't cover, you can't take your gifting and exalt your gifting to hide your black heart. If there's blackness in the heart, deal with that. Then tell us about your gifting. Because you have a need for title, position, to be seen and heard. All of that needs to be met by God. I want you to get to the point to where you could see some of the things that I've seen when the Holy Spirit operated and it was not real flamboyant, but it worked. I can remember the time uh, one of my parishioners was in the fetal position in the, um, in the uh, psych ward. And everything that came out of her mouth was negative. And I could feel the comfort of the Holy Spirit flowing up. I didn't argue. Say, no, don't say that, don't say that. Say the scripture, say the scripture. I've seen people do that, and they actually irritated me to where they had more anxiety in saying the scripture. But I could basically feel the comfort of the Holy Spirit and say, no, no, God says, God says that you're special. God says you're too valuable to be bummed out. God says... And watch, and the doctors were amazed. They watched her come out of the fetal position and start believing the Word of God. But I could feel what was coming from me was not in clever counseling. It was comfort from the Holy Spirit. They need the real thing. They don't need your input. They don't need your sympathy. And you don't need to gather troops to make yourself feel better. Because right now, you know what the culture is doing right now? Let's see if we can get down and outer people and get enough of them together so that they have a cause. Rather than seeing what is the root issue in their life, let's see how many we can gather there because we can control those kind of people. You know, one thing about a lynch mob, eventually you might hang somebody and feel like you're part of something big, but eventually you're going to start looking at one another and going, if they did it to Ralph, <laughs> I could be next. <laughs> if they'll turn on this one, they could turn on me. I loved it in Gideon's army. He said, we will strike the enemy as one man. Out of that unity, out of that love, and by the way, Gideon's army had no fear. And out of that relationship, you will strike the enemy as one man. And the enemy turned on itself. And there are numerous places in the scripture where the enemy is going to turn on yourself. We're going to see with your eyes. Watch what I will do, says the Lord. That's what he's speaking to me. Watch what I will do. Now, if you listen to the prophet on CNN or you listen to the prophet on ABC, NBC News, <laughs> then you're going to get what you get. But God says, watch what I will do. You need to have eyes to see what God's doing, ears to hear what he's saying, and actions and obedience to him. God, what are you saying? And he's saying, watch what I will do. Comfort them with the same comfort whereby you were comforted. I want a whole congregation of people. And it might be a remnant. I don't believe the whole church ever cooperates with anything worldwide, do they? <laughs> they even fight amongst themselves. So <laughs> I'm just looking for a remnant that will comfort people with the real comfort of the Holy Spirit, and not just wishful thinking, not just niceties, but basically be able to release life to them. And how do I get that? I have to first handle the craziness that's going on around me and release the love of God in those situations. What I'd like to see is a congregation do what I do with that little 18-year-old girl up in Connecticut, being bullied at school in the cafeteria, and all the girls would get around and just pick on her, invite her to a party, and then disinvite her, just plain meanness. And she goes, Pastor Dennis, you taught me years ago how to forgive, and I know how to forgive from the heart, but I'm doing it every single day. I'm forgiving those same girls. And I said, well, here, try this. Instead of waiting till you get hurt <laughs> and then forgiving, are you listening? Instead of waiting till you take the hurt in and then forgive, why not go on the offensive 
and drop down your spirit and blast them like a fire hose of love. I uh, really, and while they're going, and, 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 oh, let it flow out to them. And that was the time that she said, and the Holy Spirit turned my head to another table. She wanted to be part of that clique. And they knew it, and they knew that she never would be, so they bullied her. All of a sudden, her head turns and she sees a table of girls. They went over and found out those girls were Christians and they were praying for her. But you know what? She didn't have to forgive those girls when you, when you just release love. You went on the offense. Instead of taking in the hurt and then forgiving over and over again, why not walk in love? Why not let the peace of God rule? And here's something that we've, we've taught in the classes, and I'm going to close with this. When you forgive from the heart, how do you know if you forgave from the heart? Come on, out loud. Peace. Peace. If you paid attention after you forgive and it changes to peace, that's actually love flowing out. You want to know how to intercede? You want to love in the spirit? The other side of forgiveness is just that. So if you don't need to forgive somebody, you should be able to drop down your spirit and let a river of love flow. Out of my belly flows. That means you open the door. You don't, uh, you don't push it out. It means you emanate. When you open, it comes out. Hmm. Jennifer, come on up here and stand up here. I want to benefit people watching by video. I want to show you. When you learn to open to one another, yield to me right now. Oh, there's a fusion and a union there. You can't do that when there's a wall. If I had unforgiveness toward Jennifer, if Jennifer had unforgiveness toward me, you would feel a, uh, hi, <laughs> uh, uh, let me hug you. Uh, I don't want to live that kind of Christianity, do you? Eh, I, I, I love you, Jennifer. <laughs> don't you want the real thing? You can have that in Jesus, but he alone is the only one that can do that. You can't fake it till you make it. You have to do it from the heart, and it's got to be real. You can't give something you don't have. And so how do you get it? The next time everything feels like it's crashing in around you, release forgiveness to God, self, and others. And you say, God? Yeah, because you people blame God. I, I don't, it's really a weird theology. I don't know where you people learn that. But uh, why did God let that happen? I don't think you learn it. I think it just comes natural. It just comes natural to the flesh. That has got to be one of the dumbest things. What's wrong with you? I'm mad at God. Oh, that's... That, That'll lead you on a victorious path. <laughs> huh? That'll lead you on a victorious path. Oh, you're, you're just an uh, accident going somewhere to happen now. But really, we do. We form judgments. We think he should have done this or he should have done that. But that's also exalting us to say we know better. When God's basically saying, I see that attitude. You receive forgiveness, you get your peace back. You let him comfort you during that time where, I'm tired of waiting. Oh, receive forgiveness, God, for my impatience. Whatever you just received there, you could give it to somebody else and say, that's okay, I know you're going through a hard time, but I believe in you. And you're too, I love saying that because it was said to me once when I was ready to quit. Someone says, Dennis, you're too valuable to be bummed out. I was just a baby Christian, but I, was, I quit because I went on television as a baby Christian to give my testimony, and the guy told me I didn't do it right. And so I cried all the way home. I quit this Christianity. I'm not doing it no more. It's too hard. And it was snowing out, and I'm never going. <clears throat> but then when you receive forgiveness for your attitude, you release forgiveness to that guy who corrected you who was... Uh, 40 years your senior in the, in the things of God 
and knew what he was talking about. And you release forgiveness to him. Then you had peace. And then the next time that happened to someone else, when you went to minister to them, you actually ministered. You actually gave them something of value because it was the same comfort that you received during your, your, your time of conflict. But if you don't receive it, you can't give it. You can't give something you don't have. And you can't receive it if you're not open to receiving it. So let's stand to your feet. Say, I'm that remnant that's going to comfort the afflicted. But first I have to be comforted in my affliction. Oh, there's always got to be a hard part to it, right? But first of all, I've got to be comforted in my affliction. I have to handle the pressures of my life properly or I really don't have anything of value to give. Isn't that right? You can give them all the right answers, and that's not good enough. The people that benefited from Jennifer and I's ministry the most when we traveled in those days, those 12 years, said, here's somebody telling us how to do what we already knew we were supposed to do. That's what I want for you. I want you to be able to minister to people and say, here's... What you already know the Bible says you're supposed to do, here is how you do it. And you've got to respond properly or you cannot minister properly. So, Father, seal this work by the power of the Holy Spirit and bring, bring to pass a remnant. Was this too hard? <laughs> Every time I say, that was a hard one, they go, no. So I'll just try next week a little more. Oh, they need comforted now. <laughs> uh, we release it in Jesus' name. Seal this work by the power of the Holy Spirit. Go comfort somebody with the real thing in Jesus' name. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.